Hello and welcome everybody to our latest Temple Bar Trust talk, West Smithfield, the last ruin in London to be the new Museum of London. I'm Lucy Bullivant and I've curated the Trust's online series of talks of which this is the fourth episode after kicking off in July. I'll be chairing today's session and I'm especially delighted to welcome our two splendid speakers, Paul Williams, Principal Director of Stanton Williams Architects and Julian Harrop, Principal Director of Julian Harrop Architects. Hello, Paul and Julian. Very good to see you. So before giving you some biographical highlights about Paul and Julian and introducing today's theme, a quick word first on Temple Bar Trust. Sir Christopher Wren's Temple Bar Building in Paternoster Square the architectural gateway to the city, is home to the worshipful company of chartered architects, of which I am a liveryman. Temple Bar is managed by the Temple Bar Trust, which takes as its aim the promotion of architecture in the square mile to a wide public through a regular programme of talks and tours. And a key focus of its work is supporting greater diversity in the architectural profession, a subject of profound and pressing significance we are addressing as part of our ongoing talk series. Presenting talks online is an interim measure until we can actually use the Temple Bar building again as a unique space for meetings, dining and entertainment, hopefully very soon in 2021. So do check the Trust's website, templebartrust.org, for announcements on that front and in the here and now you can view all our recorded talks there and from um, next week you can book to attend new ones. They are all free of charge, they just require a reservation in advance. So now it's my great pleasure to tell you a little about Paul and Julian's credentials. Paul Williams founded the Sterling Prize winning practice Danton Williams Architects together with Alan Stanton in London in 1985. Today, the firm's global portfolio features the new Musée d'Art de Nantes in France, the Royal Opera House, the King's Cross campus for Central St. Martins, and the recently completed Zayed Centre for Research into Rare Diseases in Children at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London, amongst others. Paul has enjoyed an extensive career in the arts and architecture and was awarded an OBE for services to architecture by Her Majesty the Queen in 2014. He's driven by a passion for the arts and is a vocal advocate for the sector, championing the importance of the arts within our education system and campaigning for a greater focus on interdisciplinary thinking. He has extensive experience collaborating with artists, including Bridget Riley, and with curators and museum directors designing exhibitions worldwide. Stanton Williams' body of critically acclaimed exhibition and gallery design work in the UK includes projects for the v &A, the British Museum, National Portrait Gallery, Haywood Gallery, the Royal Academy, Ashmolean Museum and Tate Britain. Julian Harrop is a renowned conservation architect who's been in practice for about 50 years. 
and he is the holder of the Mies van der Rohe Award for Architecture. His practice, Julian Harrop Architects, has enjoyed intelligent architectural collaborations with Foster, Rogers, Chipperfield, Gary, SOM, Muma, and DRDH. And he is perhaps best well known for his contribution to the Neues Museum in Berlin, delivered in partnership with David Chipperfield Architects. Julian has worked on the John's, Sir John Stones Museum and the Royal Academy for some 30 years, and the practice has just completed Pitshanger Manor in Walpole Park, together with the Lakenhall Museum in the university town of Leiden in the Netherlands. Upcoming projects include the Baller Theatre in Antwerp, with all its original timber stage machinery, the Royal Academy Schools Project, and a major scheme at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, as well as a prominent city church. Paul and Julian, together with Asif Khan Architectural Studio and Landscape Ar Architects JNL Gibbons, have been entrusted with one of the largest and most significant museum projects in Europe, the transformation of parts of the historic West Smithfield Market into the new home for the Museum of London, creating a world-class cultural destination within a series of largely dilapidated historic buildings there. Multidisciplinary collective intelligence has been to the fore, and their collaborators include the structural and civil engineer AKT2 and many other exceptional consultants. Over four years, detailed design work has been done to bring forward the ambitious plan and the museum has engaged with thousands of stakeholders, including local and wider London community members and visitors on the plans, receiving overwhelming support for the project. On the 23rd of July, the City of London Corporation approved plans from the museum, a green light coming five years after the project was first announced, and works are due to start next year. Of all the global museum projects on the go currently, the ingredients of this one mean that the Museum of London's claim to be redefining what a 21st century museum can be should be taken very seriously. The opportunity being advanced for a brand new influential civic space bringing renewal to a piece of London, a very significant piece of London, where we can all engage in London's stories of reinvention and cultural diversity and imagine possible futures. It comes at a time when there's a strong desire to reevaluate and gain a better grasp of London's multifaceted identities, how our magnetic metropolitan city has developed, and to, to be inspired about this fresh reading of its dynamic cultural heritage and significance. Learning what the project stands for and how it's been evolved and being evolved is fundamental to that. So we'll really look forward to Paul and Julian's talk. Afterwards, we'll have a Q&A discussion. So please put your questions to them in the chat box and specify whether it's for one or other of them or to both. Paul and Julian will alternate in presenting, starting with Paul. So thank you, Paul, over to you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, obviously, you, you have mentioned the team, and I will just reinforce the fact that um, whatever Julie and I talk about today, we are talking as a team. Asif is not with us. Uh, Joe Gibbons isn't with us. Um, and the museum isn't with us. Sharon Ahmed. Uh, I think the engineering team that you talked about that has actually come on board post-winning the competition uh, AKT and Arabs and GNT Bureau for, you know, they are Studio Fractal for Lighting, Momentum, and I could name a number here uh, that are all very much a part of the development of the project. <clears throat> so we're presenting really where the teams got to at this point in time. I am, obviously, these, um, uh, these sort of presentations are rather difficult because we can't use our arms and I'm sort of trapped on a chair here, but I suppose I would reinforce the fact that uh, we feel hugely privileged to have um, given the opportunity to reimagine 
transform these group of existing buildings, um, especially I think in an area actually not far from my studio, not far from Studio or Asset Studio, uh, in a way uh, that is so evidently woven in to the fabric of the city and to the medieval street patterns. But what I would like to say, we won the we won the scheme in um, uh, 2016, the end of 2016, August. We were told that we'd been awarded the scheme. And there's quite a lot of time has elapsed since then. I just wanted to set the scene of what we've been doing prior uh, to this presentation and prior to, of course, uh, getting the plan commission, as you said, fairly recently. We've been in constant dialogue with the curatorial team. They've become very much a part of the design team themselves. And I think what it, what comes across very evidently to us that um, the dialogue that so often missed the competition stage, you know, because we have changed our design, it has developed and grown, and I think much better for that, is very much through that dialogue with the client, with the curatorial team. I think importantly at the same time, really understanding the building in greater depths, um, the level of dilapidation of the buildings are far greater than we ever imagined. Um, but we have had time to reflect. We've been able to understand the strengths and the limitations of the building, absorb, as it were, their sound and touch, their energy. We've stood in there and allowed the buildings to affect us to such an extent that I think I've certainly learned that how important it is when you enter into these time capsules, as it were, the need to go back in time to understand before you actually go forward. And this time has allowed us to do that. And of course, Julian's knowledge and history of the site has been fundamental in us understanding that. And I suppose really the sheer physicality and the rawness of the interiors when people go, I think they will be blown away in the same way as we were. And what they instill, I think, certainly in us as a design team and people have gone and it sort of triggers imagination, which is fundamental really is the main aim of the Museum of London to trigger imagination but it also I think uh, touches those primordial reflexes within us it's all to do with hidden treasure and digging um, they are remarkably powerful evocative buildings the general market and the poultry market but at the same time as harnessing that rawness which we've got to keep uh, we've obviously got to provide the organizational logic to the building. And I think this is the, I wanted to finally say here, what we've been asked to do, um, as I said, is to design a museum with the Museum of London team to really transform the museum um, and I think offer potential um, continued evolution. I think the evolution is fundamental. I think Sharon talks very much about whatever they are on day one, they have to remain agile. They have to engage with the local community, which is fundamental. And the vibrant 24 seven culture that they're now embedded in. And clearly that wasn't the case at London Wall in the Palamoy building that they built in 77, I think. So I finished really this introduction really with Sharon's uh, a quote from her some time ago when she talks about this project of ours as a building that it's their headquarters. She said it's our soapbox that's going to serve London's most significant portal and London's memory. So what it's going to be, it's going to be a place for the voices of Londoners. They're going to be heard in their various right across London, both past and present. So that really sums up the position where we are, having just entered into stage four um, of the design process. Uh, perhaps we can start off with slides. Can I, I'll bring those up if that's um, okay. Can you see that slide there with a, a plan of um, the city? Yeah. Right, I just, the, the reason for showing this slide is that the Museum of London uh, obviously is moving from this smaller um, London Wall site, you can see, that really 
really isn't embedded in the sort of richness of the city of London, the activities. It's moving not that far to the market building. And of course, it's going to be linked, it's going to become the western end of the culture mile that the uh, Corporation of London are actually delivering part of a master plan. On the eastern end is the Barbican and the Guildhall School of Music and Dance. And the idea is that um, this uh, this link, ah, that's gone backwards, uh, that link that goes from West Smithfield uh, to Long Lane to Beach Street will be linking these two buildings. And of course, the meat markets uh, that are operating fully at the moment will be leaving their site in 2028 that's the intention and the buildings will then become part of this big master plan and this public realm scheme that uh, is being uh, planned at the moment i think the um, the reason for showing you this slide uh, is the the relevance of the museum moving to this market site as i said now embedded very much in this sort of creative hub in this um, so you can see the the circles that uh, radiate out and we describe this as is a plan we developed actually a competition stage we called it the expanded museum and when you start looking at the sites around whether it's the hospital uh, uh, St Bartholomew the oldest hospital or uh, St Bartholomew's the great the oldest parish church in London it's redolent in stories, the William Wallace, the, the, the uh, Tyler, you know, there's some um, fantastic stories to be told, both within the building and without. And remember the important thing about the museum, this is all about storytelling. But I wanted on this slide just to make one, I think, really important point. Uh, it shows the River Fleet going down, you can see from the north, heading down to the River Thames. And of course, Julian is going to be talking about Smoothfield. And the point about Smoothfield, it, uh, the, the River Fleet played such an important part of the lifeblood of that, of that area, the pasture land, which was part of the livestock market that's been there for 800, 800 years, 2,000 years, I think, nearly. But importantly, the River Fleet, and this is the story I like, is now moving into the River Thames, and of course the River Thames being really the lifeblood of London, is giving up objects almost week in, week out of the history of London. A lot of those objects are actually heading back to the Museum of London. So there's this wonderful, um, we have this wonderful river that when the tide is down, it is expressing and showing and revealing these, remember, this, these remnants of the past. And as the river expands, so I've been told fairly recently, actually the uh, prehistorical uh, remains are now being found as the edges are being eroded. And again, these elements are being, these objects are being brought to the Museum of London. I think this is an image, I think Julian, I'm not sure whether you actually drew this one, but I think it's a, it's a very good diagram that really it's taking the culture mile and expanding it a little bit more. And it just shows you the level of these amazing hubs that are of creativity that are near and adjacent to the, uh, the site the museum's moving to. You have the Thames Bank, the, uh, the Tate, and you have St. Paul's Cathedral. Then you have the music of um, the Centre for Music, that has been designed by uh, uh, Dilla, Scofido and Renfrew. Uh, I think it's Simon Rattle's uh, venture. Then you have the market, and of course you've got the Barbican and the Guildhall, as I said. And uh, moving to the north, you then have the um, importance of Farringdon Station, which has Crossrail going through it, and it's hugely connected. So this site, if you look at King's Cross and St. Pancras, the last image on the... Um, these are, these are train links, and in a couple of hours, you're in Paris and Amsterdam. So not only it is a site redolent in stories and history and texture and grain, it's wonderfully connected around the country. And Crossrail, obviously, is going to be key 
uh, opening fairly soon in London. So these are the um, <clears throat> buildings. Uh, the left-hand side with that small little dome is the general market, which the museum will be in, and then you have the poultry market with the um, amazing um, elliptical paraboloid roof at the top. Ironically, both of those domes designed by Jack Drunz of Arabs. The two other forms either side of the meat market by the rotunda that you can see there, and they will be vacated, as I said, in 2028. So these are the um, buildings we're talking about. The blue areas are the areas, the campus of buildings that uh, we've been asked to develop. The general market, the poultry market for the Museum of London and for the uh, City of London Corporation, we've been asked to develop the fish market, Red House um, and Iron Mountain. And you can see an aerial view here I think of these two astonishing roofs that we're going to be, I'm going to be showing you in a minute, we're going to be talking about. I think the aim of um, the fly through that, that I'm, we're going to be showing you later on, which is a very simple tool that we've been using in the uh, studio and we've been using for the curatorial team, is to convey not only these spaces above ground, but the vast cavernous spaces below ground that we're going to try and convey to you uh, earlier, but uh, later on in the um, talk. But I, finally, I'd like to just make this point that the annex building you can see here, that triangular site at the bottom, was initially part of the condition brief, but has subsequently been, um, uh, we have not developed the museum project in there and we've taken over all of the uh, poultry market. So it literally is those two buildings we're looking at. That's the underside of the uh, 17 meter dome in the general market. This is below that floor. These, this is the vault. You can see that actually the, the uh, West Smithfield Road is running over the top of those. And here you can see this amazing handkerchief um, <clears throat> double curved uh, arrow vault designed by Arabs, as we said, uh, in uh, T.P. Bennett's building. And in the image on the left, left right hand side is Byers Wall. And that's the route you can take um, any of you tomorrow. And that would see walking in between the traders units on either side. Here we have the fish market roof that um, Actually, we've started to uh, refurbish um, as we speak. Uh, so that work has actually started. And the uh, project here for the city is due to open at the same time as the museum in 2024. So, Julian, do you want to um, run through the evolution of the market? Yes, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to start with the this idea that the smooth field is outside the walls of the city, as you said, adjacent to Bart's. Uh, but this illustration of penned cattle on this level uh, platform, which runs westwards to the fleet, um, and then the wall of the city with St. Paul's behind. Next, please. And then the incredible revolution that occurs with the excavation of the smooth fields. So there's St. Paul's again on the skyline. But just contemplate the two gentlemen in the foreground looking at a plan. Perhaps they might have been architects. And then down in the depths, the root of the tracks to be laid uh, to connect the Dover and Chatham Railway with the first underground railway in London coming from Paddington to Farringdon. And then in the enlargement on the right-hand side, I just think it's worth looking at the scale of the two chaps working on the top of those plated girders made of wrought iron with their riveted connections and then just brought into action by blocks and tackles on these great 
timber uh, poles. Um, the scale is just Im immense. Paul has shown you some of the images of the quarter mile long building that of which we have responsibility for one part. And if we go to the next slide, we'll just see what you can't see today, and that is the poultry market as Horace Jones built it as part of that enfilade coming from Charterhouse to Farringdon. It, it was one of his most elaborate market buildings with a whole series of buildings with their individual chimneys within a curtain of classicism with the four great corner towers um, anchoring them in this sequence of east-west market buildings. And on the right in April 1957, those who were trading in the market describe it as suddenly becoming aware of the smell of smoke. And beneath them, there must have been thousands of tons of chickens which were alight because it was in the basement in the storerooms that a fire had started perhaps connected with the underground railway one doesn't know but that conflagration then came up through the floor burst through the floor and consumed the whole of the accommodation within the outer curtain the outer curtain was left and demolished and that left a great pit in the ground within which Thomas Bennett constructed this building. So four and a half or five years after that conflagration, this building was complete. And it's the only listed building in the museum's uh, campus. And it's listed because of its exceptional construction is a concrete frame building with, as Paul has mentioned, this great dome covering the central market space. It's a dome which uh, is 225 feet long by 135 feet wide. You can see that it has roof lights which light the space below and then lunettes on each of the four sides, which provide support to the curved edge beams. The shell doesn't stop at that line of the glazing, but actually projects beyond and has these elegant raked columns which support the overhang. And then around the edge, you have these individual traders' uh, offices, and those had, have vertical staircases which go down to the trading floor and then down to the storerooms in the basement. And here is construction taking place and the gentleman with the Bakelite phone in the middle is by way of a line which goes down to the pavement ringing the office, perhaps talking to Jack Zunz to sort of say, Shall we put another two tons of tension into the post tension wire within that jack just below him? Mm -hmm. Health and safety is clearly um, of concern. Um, we just cannot imagine the translation in building construction as it's taken place since those days which are within living memory. On the right, you see the perfect timber former, which was made for that thin shell. And there's the reinforcement. Uh, it's 75 millimeters thick. And then there's one of those roof lights. And beyond that, pouring the concrete. The concrete's uneven on the outer side. So sometimes the screed, uh, which uh, evens it out, is one inch thick. Sometimes it's seven inches thick. And by scaling off that irregularity, we're able to load the dome with an insulating layer which will support the new copper roof. Next, please. Within the 
building, there's this wonderful control tower, a real, uh, really the essence of 60s construction, stainless steel frames to both the window walls and vitreous glass panels, uh, a precast uh, terrazzo staircase which rises from ground to the elevated uh, balcony that runs around the whole of this interior and then above that the edge beam with its supporting columns and the lunette glazing. Below in the basement this wonderful corridor with, with these great blue sliding doors were, were to secure the, uh, the poultry uh, in refrigerated conditions so that it could then be taken by the individual trader from these, uh, these stores up to the trading floors. <laughs> Externally, we have um, a wonderful new town look to the building and T.P. Bennett, who designs the building, he was the chairman of Crawley, New Town. Um, and on the left, we have the traders offices at the top with its crystal glazing. And then below that, shielding the covered loading bays, you have these wonderful hexagonal lights in precast concrete set within the panels between blue brickwork. On the, in the center, you see the way in which the lenses distort reality as you look out. And so a red vehicle is passing. And then on the right hand side, you can see the way in which the lenses focus the light on the Peterhead gran granite on the inner wall. Next. This model um, from Paul's office is wonderful because. What it does, it captures the relationship of the undercroft to what we're seeing above ground. You can see the elements of the poultry market, which I've been describing in the model on the right with the handkerchief down removed. And then to the left of that, this great trench of the, the um, Dover and Chatham Railway, which comes up from Blackfriars to then move east and north and to carry today the Thameslink route. In the centre of the framework on the left, which is the structure over the, uh, the former sidings, which becomes a great underground gallery for the museum, you can see a circle and that circle is below the, the steel frame dome that is at the centre of the uh, general market. And what it shows you is the twisted geometry of the above ground civic buildings <laughs> below ground engineering. Next, please. On the uh, right. Julian, it's... we're going to have to move sort of quickly. I mean, uh, Lucy, when did we actually start this? Was it, um, I see we're 44 minutes into the um, presentation. No. Don't worry about time at all, but uh, each each segment of your presentation is um, is vital as part of the narrative. But uh, we're, we're fine for time. Please continue. Sorry, Julian. I'm just getting a bit anxious. There. <laughs> on, the, on the right is the um, is the stop brick construction of the retaining wall and the undercroft with its immense complexity that you see distributing the stress from two retaining walls, retaining a huge underground volume um, coming to a call. On the left-hand side, you have hydraulic hoists, which uh, bring the goods from the railway level up to the selling level. In the background, you can see a little steam engine. Uh, next, please. And that is, that is this Stevenson steam engine, an 044. Um, and next, please, you have Thameslink rushing through today. And then next, please, tomorrow, you have Crosslink. And so beneath this civic uh, 
campus, you have uh, a running railway of, of a wonderful extent of 19th century um, construction. Above, you have an, ice, an icing cake um, civic uh, presentation to the world by Horace Jones, the city architect, based on uh, a French Gothic from south of the Loire, um, influenced by Renaissance detailing. And you see the fairy tale spires on the top with their weather vanes to tell you where the weather is coming from before weather forecasts, and then the way in which the pitches of the pavement are taken under the canopies extending from the first floor level. Next, please. And I wonder if this lady really knows whether she's walking over the top of a steam railway. It is to emphasize the civic plate on which the um, on which the buildings stand from this engineering below. On next, please. If she goes in to buy a carcass, this is the interior of the uh, general market. Um, and it has, as you see, an early electric lighting scheme by Edson and one of the uh, pavilions uh, providing Tally Clark's offices for the pitches below. Next, please. And this is the partly cleared space of the uh, general market, the concrete dome above, and then these tertiary columns of the um, pergolas, which, which are to be taken out and then reinstated later on. Next, please. We've now come to the phoenix columns, which are architecturally and historically one of the most significant parts of this uh, uh, enterprise, this whole building. You have here castan decoration around a castan plug on top of a wrought iron column. You have the uh, girders coming in to sit on top of that column. The reason these columns were used is because they're made of wrought iron sections riveted together. They're therefore lightweight with a cast iron. Next, thank you. On the left hand side, um, you can see the girders coming into the top of the column. In the mid middle, you can see the, uh, the cast iron plug at the top of the wrought iron tube. In coming to the right, you can see the cast down foot to the column with its enclosing architectural dressing and then on the far right you can see the girder engagement with all its plate work on top of the column next please and a cultural treasure treasure discovered in our state we had in our stabilization contracts for the general market it was in a state of collapse and we had five stabilization uh, contracts and one of those came upon what we believe to be one of the last cocoa rooms in London, and it's Lockhart's Cocoa Rooms, within which, next please, are these uh, amazing Pilkington tile, tiles with uh, this Voisy-esque frieze, next please, Art Nouveau metalwork, and you have below the frieze, you you have um, a, a moulded skirting, and then above that you have a, a cream ground, and then above that you have an elaborate frieze as well. Next, please. You come to across the road from the general market to the Red House, and this is the Red House as we inherited it with this rather sim Singaporean uh, scaffolding. Um, and draped nets, um, insecure, and the picture of neglect. These buildings were abandoned in 1993. And so what you have is buildings which could not be anything other than a, in a ruined state. And it's extraordinary that they should have survived in London in this condition. Next, please. On the left, you see total collapse within the Red House. And on the right, you see it having been stabilized using 
automated machinery without men in order to safeguard the dangerous process involved. Next, please. And then we have collapse four, four weeks ago where the precast gutter filled with water and was in, inadequately secured to the pretense, uh, pretense beams which crank, form a crank to uh, covering to the roadway. And you can see the hanging planks which uh, link, which were surcharged load on the gutters. Next, please. We pass on to you, Paul, uh, to take us through the scheme. Thank you, Julian. <clears throat> so you can see here, we have the model that uh, we produced and we're going to just look at the um, general market and the ultra market there, not the annex building. You will see that in the fly through. I think um, what I said earlier, the important thing is that we have with the uh, curatorial team developed um, a strategy, an organizational sort of um, framework for this um, project. So you can see um, the general market has our time and past time in it. This central street that is uh, called West Poulter Avenue that will be the main entrance is real time. And that's actually over the uh, tracks below, you can see. And then you move into the poultry market. You enter into the temporary exhibition galleries there and then go on to the upper level of the poultry market that we've now created, uh, which is all to do with imagined time and views out to the city of London and below in the vaults that um, uh, Julian just showed you with the blue doors, we have deep time. I think the scales are there partly because we've always this, what's been this wonderful balance between a building of the 1880s and this uh, uh, 1960s building and how we can best work with them and how, how we can actually introduce the museum template, the brief as it were, and impose it properly into the existing buildings. I think what, what has developed, uh, as, as Sharon talks about, is a museum that is recast and is no longer chronological, and that's quite key, and the equally a scheme that allows for flexibility. So I was saying earlier, I'm going to go quite quickly through these. You can see the central street, uh, uh, the two arrows that enter into West Poulter Avenue. You either go to the left into the pot, uh, left into the general market, or right into the um, poultry market. I think the the general market is an event space. This is a a public forum. This is where the public will be allowed in there. Events will take place where you move down that arrow in there into a linear stair that takes you down into the sort of underbelly of the general market itself. You have entrances and number of entrances in the um, general market. Uh, so the building potentially is quite porous. I think that's quite a big difference, and that's a dialogue that's been going on for a long time, certainly since we started, how poor is the general general market can and can't be, how poor is a museum can be, and sort of that engagement with the community around. But what these entrances allow us to do is to open up the uh, complex uh, at different times with different entrances and allow the museum to close other parts of the building down. The temporary exhibition gallery is uh, within the um, poultry market. I said we have learning, which is a fundamental part of the project. We have 40 schools a day, right, at the Museum of London. But what we have uh, delivered, I think, here now, and together, we have a, a project that allows for deliveries to take place with loading bays. So deliveries can move in on that upper level, you can see our charter house. That, that allows uh, objects to be taken either straight into temporary exhibitions, taken up to research labs at the upper level, or down into collection stores below. We have routes for uh, school parties as well, as you can see in these learning areas. So here, this is showing you the um, basement level going down into the, the sort of undercroft of the uh, general market into the permanent galleries and the I, whether my cursor i don't know whether you can see that 
what we have found while we've been working on this project is uh, 180 additional square meters of, um, we call it the catacombs, these amazing tunnels that have now been unearthed, which are going to be part of the sort of visual experience. And on the poultry market, you can see the collection store. Now, this was always the issue at competition stages. You see the, the, the train line going between the two buildings. Um, and I have to say, we did propose that uh, there was a tunnel that links the permanent galleries to the collection store. Uh, but uh, that was thrown out fairly quickly by the museum for, I'm sure, reasons that um, actually didn't, it didn't require the tunnels to be built at the end of the day, because at the competition stage, we were only given the basement of the poultry market and the annex building to work with. Having worked on it for some months, we realized that didn't work. And the city finally offered the full all of the poultry market to the museum. And that now is where we, which has allowed a wonderful link, obviously, at street level. So, Julian. Thank you very much. Uh, here we have a, a prototype elevation which we did for the City of London just to try to erect scaffolding on two units of the external envelope to explore the repairs of stone and brick and timber. And that enabled us to begin to establish with the team levels of cleaning of stone and also the where where we could get the bricks to match the red bricks of the interior. We were also able to look at the, uh, the language of shop fronts that Horace Jones had established and to understand how they related to the, de the design of the upper levels. On the right hand side, you can see some of Horace Jones uh, drafts for leaseholders of the market uh, at the top. And then the amazing day when we took the uh, covering off the um, uh, Farringdon Road elevation, there were a whole range of original shop fronts. And so below that is a, a little reconstruction drawing which shows the original shop fronts underneath this Romanesque uh, palazzo facing the street with its pedimented central bay and it has huge sash windows in it, in it of enorm enormous size and scope. Next please. Here on the left the barn and bricks which uh, uh, were used on the general market. Those match the Royal Albert Hall bricks and they come from the top of the River Hamble. In the right hand side, the top band has been uh, had render taken off it, which was loose and dangerous. And we've had well, we developed with a contractor a methodology for inserting these new bricks. On the lower left, you can see some of the raw bricks of the construction of the building itself. This is the engineering building, and then you have this red brick and stone civic face. Uh, to make the engineering decent. Um, and there you have uh, plum stock bricks and on the corner you've got gold bricks. So a whole vocabulary of brickwork throughout the, the, um, the, uh, the building. Next, please. And at competition stage, we just use these three pots as uh, a way of entering into some sort of dialogue and discussion with the museum about the approach to repairing the building. On the left, you have uh, a crack, uh, cracked pot, simply um, repaired invisibly. Um, and then in the center, you use rivets to clip together the fragmentary parts of the pot. And on the right-hand side, you replace the part of the pot which have been damaged in a beautiful way, establishing the original form of the pot itself. And this, in a curious way, is an example of trying to repair the building 
in a way which retains its, its essence but translates it in a particular way. This is the copper roof, which will, new copper roof, which will go over the dome. It was laid uh, originally by T.P. Bennett and, and had uh, eroded, has eroded away and is defective, but it's defective because it's made of soft copper and the sheets are in too long a length. So we've used a harder copper, a half, te half uh, tempered copper, and that means that the plate of copper will move. And so we use this concertina, uh, which you see in the gutter around the skylight, to stop the skylight tearing the, the new copper. And so this is an interpretation of the language of coppersmithing in order to adapt to the repair demand of the building. Next, please. Here uh, on, on the right, particularly, you've got the cast iron columns and pilasters of the outside. And there are, on the right-hand side, 22 coats of paint and they have eroded away. And by doing paint sections, we were able to find there are, there are about seven different color schemes in the 120 years that the building has stood. Next, please. And the, the lowest one of those, the most, uh, the original uh, ambition of Jones was to use cast iron to pretend it was rubbed brickwork. And so it's a chestnut color. It relates to the rubbed brickwork on the engine house. And so in our little prototype scheme, we've used that as the, as the color, which is a starting point for the debate on color in the building. Next, please. This is salvage uh, of materials. And so even, even within 20th century buildings, and I find it funny that I'm saying that, of course, 20th century buildings, when they have to be demolished or evaluated, have material which uh, can't remain where it is. And so it might have another purpose. And these are the racks for supporting carcasses. And they have found another purpose in the, uh, in the education lecture room uh, in, the load in the south loading bay. Then... Uh, on the top right, a little uh, display of just collected fragments right at the beginning of the scheme, walking around, picking things up so that we could engage with the museum about whether there were objects they needed or wished to have for the, adopt for their collection or whether, in fact, there were things we could recycle. On the left, collecting timber. On the bottom left, different types of brick. In the middle, uh, lampshades, and on the right, uh, dismantled spiral stairs. Next, please. On the left, a gasolier, and on the right, the pergola fray, uh, cast iron columns. And I just want to say how interesting they are because they're not just a column, but they're a column with a foundation base, as you see, the great square plate at the bottom. That means they have had a mobility within the general market. And so Jones is designing not just uh, for a static layout, but for the ability of, to bring change to the layout. Next, please. 47 spiral staircases on the ground floor, dismantled on the right. Next, please. And so to the half built, uh, fish market as it was on the annex site. Um, it was half built, it was designed by Jones, then half built. And here we'll be taking away the valances on the cross road bridge uh, so that we leave it in its skeletal form in order to present his great entrance to the fish market in, in proper unrestrained fashion. Next, please. And we'll also be re establishing the skyline of the Snow Hill Tower at the bottom, where the four entwined sturgeons will be re established on the skyline. And then I think, Paul.
Lucy, do we have time for the fly through? We do indeed. It's an in essential component of the story. I know you've twisted our arm to put this in. And I know I, I did. I'm, re I'm really looking forward to seeing it. I will it say to just to, to, to people that are uh, sort of listening there <laughs> that uh, this is very much a design tool. It's not a slick presentation by any stretch of imagination, but what it does do, it uh, has helped us convey to the client how the spaces unfold. But it is very simple, but it's been a tool that's been hugely valuable. Uh, can everybody, can you actually see this? No, I'm not, oh, hold on. Is this starting now? So these are the buildings. I'm going to quickly, I'm going to sort of give a sort of very quick commentary as we move through. Uh, you can see the canopy going across West Smithfield there that we're about to descend into. The annex building we will come to and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so we're in West Smithfield now. Going under canopy, there's going to be a wonderful signpost really for the Culture Mile and for the Museum of London. And so what we have done working with the client is stop at different points and just show the sort of early CGIs that we've been developing during the um, design stages. This here, you can see that big brick canopy that uh, is runs across this poultry. We've taken away the brick that exposes the offices on the poultry market, but equally it exposes the elevation of the general market. So we have portals on either end of the uh, West Poultry Avenue. And this is going to be called real time. Um, this is where the public will enter here. This is going to be the area where when there are events taking place, this will be the gathering point. And then decision will be taken by the visitor either to turn left as we are now into the general market or right into the poultry market. So now we move into our time uh, in, this is the museum headings. You can see the vault there that I said was 70 meters wide designed. We are <coughs> changing the ventilation system there. It will be naturally ventilated uh, uh, and with uh, underfloor heating and cooling system. So these are some of the images. These are Asif Khan's images here of the, um, these are the sort of education spaces, bookshop uh, within the general market. We call them the inner and outer core because West Smithfield actually does slope to uh, the Farringdon Street. The, the houses that there were on the outside go with the slope and then we have a series of internal areas, an inner crust that actually are run with a flat floor within the building. I said it is devoid of detail. It's devoid of the rawness that I talked about. I think it's really important that you sort of, the images that we've been showing you. Um, and here, in terms of triggering imagination, this idea now we're moving down through the sedimentary layers of London's past. We're going to be moving onto a floor plate that the Roman Legion would have tried where a sort of just prior to them departing these shores in the fifth century. I mean, that idea of walking on the same ground as the Romans. <laughs> and we have, we have these amazing seven metre high jacquard vaults. And what we're moving down to now, and it reminds me of a competition stage when we were walking into the space. Uh, there's an image coming up here, the salt store, the London salt store. We heard the rumble of a train coming and all of the shortlisted architects ran with their cameras to this opening in the wall. And we started photographing the train. Now, you know, if you've got adults acting like kids, it's, you know, we already have all of that. The main thing is that we mustn't, we must lose that wonderful sort of energy that the building has. These are the vaults. Um, these are very, these are renders really. We're not designing the exhibition. Uh, the 
studio uh, Bruckner are working on that with the museum at the moment. These are all the tunnels that were not part of the competition scheme. Nobody knew about them, and they've been opened up uh, actually since we've started on the project. They are fantastic. Uh, they will be part of the scheme. And, of course, we, as I said, call them the catacombs. Uh, they're very special. So you've got to imagine that an exhibition place. So coming back to West Poultry Avenue now, we'll have a quick fly through the uh, poultry market. That's the entrance as it is at the moment with Buyer's Walk that uh, I referred to earlier. We're leaving all the grills, signage, wherever possible, uh, as much of the uh, materiality and the uh, salvage we're keeping and using wherever we can. This is the temporary exhibition gallery because obviously it's not only spatial requirements in the museum, but it's environmental requirements as well. Um, we're hopefully, uh, in terms of Briam, we, we are looking for outstanding. We are going to plug into the local grid. We're working with CityGen, uh, which is obviously part of the GLA's requirements. Here, the staircase on either side, moving up to the upper floor, the top of the temporary gallery. I think what's interesting, I read that T.B. Bennett actually designed this building actually with a full first floor, uh, not as it is now, but the traders uh, reacted against it because they wanted to be trading on the ground floor. I think that explains exactly volumetrically why it looks like it does at the moment. But up here will be Imagine Time. This is where there will be the first views of the London skyline at this level, which is a wonderful foil to the sort of underworld of the uh, general market. These are sort of ideas for structures we talked about with the museum that could be included. And there we have a uh, cafe to the east. That's that wonderful little pavilion that uh, Julian talked about. We have further sort of presentation spaces aligned to the uh, lecture theater at the east end of the gallery. Now, here is where the research laboratories are going to be in the offices that exist at the moment. So the public will be able to see finds that are being uncovered in London will come to this space. And this is going to be a key new part of the um, visitor experience of actually seeing the objects that, as I was saying earlier, have been brought up from the River Thames, the sort of bed of the River Thames, they'll be able to see that. At this further end, this is where all the offices of the uh, museum will be. That gives you an overview of the temporary exhibition gallery, full environmental control, obviously uh, performing to gallery standards and government standards. So we're now moving down into the lower ground of the poultry market. This is where the collection store is. Lifts take you down. Um, this bridge, this metal bridge that people will walk across to get to the temporary exhibition gallery, what it allowed us to do is for them to be very aware of this space below ground. And the museum are calling this deep time. In the loading bays um, the, to the south, we have the learning spaces. And you can see in terms of reworking the, remember the uh, hanging units uh, we're using within the structures um, of the education spaces. This is the existing annex site, which we're developing, as we said, for the, Cor the Corporation of London. I think importantly here, uh, the Red House is going to be converted into offices. And one assumes that the people who uh, inhabit and take on, uh, they will have the same ethos as the sort of cultural center uh, and center of the culture mile that's being, being delivered by the, uh, by the city. This new addition obviously is picking up on the rhythm of the Red House. 
the moving round in Snow Hill. And then actually, I think we, we what I do find personally very exciting is the wonderful arcade that exists by, in the fish market. The fish market was designed by Horace Jones, but uh, he died before it's completed. This gives you an idea of the condition of it. Um, it would be wonderful if this did become a wonderful restaurant here. I mean, it'd be perfect for that. It'd be wonderful, perfect for a fish restaurant. The roof is being actually refurbished, as I said earlier. So we now move out back into, uh, through that arcade, and we now move down into uh, West Smithfield. These uh, images now coming up is part of the shop fronts with the canopies and the awnings and with the different uses and potentially the different institutions might be inhabiting that, obviously properly curated by the museum itself. And I think finally, uh, this image, we've always, this is Iron Mountain, which is um, has the rail going underneath it. Uh, we really want the public realm to move into this space, really creating a street theatre. We think this would be a wonderful uh, venue and finale for anybody that walks from the Barbican. The final shot is, again, reinforcing um, the museum. It's a 24-7 culture, which the museum intends to participate in fully. I think that's, um, that's the end of the fly-through. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paul and Julian. That's a tremendous presentation and absolutely packed full of valuable insights about how you've approached the layers and levels of historic fabric of the site. Such a clearly such a special future London, London microcosm. And I think, you know, that um, you're um, uh, revealing for us very well, very clearly how to retain the essence, but also to translate it and provide creative evolution to the imaginative reinvention of West Smithfield, the last ruin in London, and give the Museum of London such a, a vital portal and versatile space. So no longer will it be chronologically organized. Um, it will be porous. It will be, um, I mean, compared with their current site, it will be so much, much of a, rich, fertile environment of confluence and stories and connections. So, you know, doing so much to evolve and embed the new new identity of the museum. And even, uh, as you say, forging an intimate relationship with the Fleet River below. Um, I'm just looking to see what audience questions we might have got lined up. Yes, we have some um, impressed people. What a roof. Wow, very difficult to decide whether to keep various elements or, or not. Wonderful. So much work still left to do. Somebody else has, has made that comment. Um, now, we've got a, I can see we've got one or two questions standing by, but let me uh, just kick off with one of my own. Um, obviously, it's a huge, massive opportunity, very significant for the museum to reinvent itself at the same time, both spatially and curatorially, to reinvent its brand, reinvent its, its um, cultural significance as part of London. Um, and as your collaborating architect, Asif Khan, has said, to design a new museum at this juncture, particularly one inside a Victorian market hall, um, is a huge, great responsibility. And it demands from you as the team members a vision of how you should shape your future city and uh, citizenry as well, moreover. So um, how would you say you're actually going about the creating of spaces and, and experiences to promote the necessary shared values in an in open, inclusive way? I mean, the porosity is obviously one of many tactics, um, but also including the connected exterior public spaces. Yes, I think, well, is that to either of us? That's to either of you, yes. I, I, I would just say that I think your point about the this outer crust that uh, 
all the shop fronts on Farringdon Road, on the Charter House, on West Smithfield. It has a wonderful potential for uh, different either institutions or individual startup people that actually it uh, would will gravitate into those spaces. And I said the museum intends to curate the sort of in you know the people that take on these spaces. Um, you know that's that's quite key. So you have the community moving into the building, and I said the museum moving out because obviously they have a massive outreach. Um, program. They have the 40 uh, uh, school classes coming every day. Mm -hmm. uh, Sharon's aspiration is that every school child will go and come to the Museum of London. And I think the important thing is that the interior of the general market, we've talked not lightly about it being a forum. We want it to be seen to be owned by Londoners. We would love to think that, uh, for example, uh, West Poultry Avenue in the morning, if it would open up at seven o'clock in the morning, we could have yoga groups going in there. There could be dance groups going in there. They could take it on. There is a sense of uh, London public own it. And obviously it has its museum functions, but it would be lovely for that street to operate out of hours. Many different activities taking place with both the other buildings potentially closed or one open, one closed. So that porosity, although the the poultry market is less, you know, it's a quite introverted building. The, t the loading bays on the south side, which engage with the um, Culture Mile, at the east end, we're proposing to have a lecture theatre that could be uh, people could move in at that entrance whenever they wanted to. And equally, we have the educational uh, entrance as well. So it's very rich in how it can be used. Very flexible. Yeah, and fantastic. Do, Julian, do you want to add something to what Paul's just said? We're, we're getting lots of questions now coming up, so get ready. <laughs> I would just say, uh, and it's only a tiny point, it is that we're very much on a journey and uh, even mm -hmm. What the builder builds is not anything like the end. It isn't the creation of the museum. We're creating the stage on which the museum will actually perform. We have these five vast spaces. Uh, they were furnished with market and traders' units, and now they are to be furnished again for the new purpose of the museum. And so this idea, as Sharon states it, that it is the beginning for her when she occupies the building is still way beyond where we are at the moment. Mm. Very interesting. So um, Chris Dyson has said he feels it's a, a fabulous challenge. You both feel you both um, appear very well matched to the project and um, clearly the buildings were falling down. So how do you determine what to shore up on and what to rebuild? Oh, it's very easy. There's a methodology about it. Yeah. It falls down, it kills you. And so you, the, the <laughs> um, we had five contracts of stabilization. And uh, in most cases, there is a methodology of decay, which is often columns of decay. And if you've got those, then you've got sound structure around them. So you can consolidate the sound structure and either move horizontally or vertically up the cause of decay. Um, and in the Red House, it was so severe, we had to use machines and mining techniques and abseiling techniques in order to get to spaces which were too large to bridge into and to cantilever into. But um, it's, uh, it's Andrew Coles in the office working with the team on site Who've, who has been particularly involved to really open up the building for the design team and the museum to see, because there was about um, over half of it was closed because it was dangerous. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's interesting when Julian showed those images of the um, cocoa rooms, um, 
they were concealed, all of those tiles, for uh, only until about six months ago. We really knew that they were there, the extent of them. And suddenly we realized there was this jewel sitting <laughs> on the corner of uh, West Poultry Avenue. I mean, it was, uh, and I think the buildings is still, there's still things that it's going to offer up to us, Julian, isn't it, as we sort of venture further into this project. So I think it, it requires, I thought this is, this is the issue with the project of this order. Uh, unfortunately, you have contracts, you have drawings, and you. Um, it would be lovely if the contracts had a sort of flexibility in to allow um, change at certain points in the sort of uh, journey to completion. When we find things, obviously, we're going to, um, we'll, we'll, we'll discover how flexible they are, are further on down the line. But, um, yeah. Um, the issue of climate change, urban resilience, is a very pressing one. How is the building future-proofed against it? Um, one of the other audience members would like to know. Well, uh, I mean, if you think, all churches are looking at their gutters and downpipes. And in that sense, um, we are taking the rain which falls on the roofs and it's all going into... Um, holding tanks before being discharged uh, to to the sewers and to the fleet. Um, and in, we had some wacky ideas at the beginning that we'd form water rills down the road and we'd have a well where it all debouched down to the fleet. But those are competition ideas. But uh, the the sustainability and the recycling of timber is one of the instances I would mentioned because we have enormous wonderful baltic pine joists which are decayed just at the end where they go in the wall and so we've salvaged a lot from the buildings with the elements of the internal market which have been taken down and those are now being recycled as structures to mend the rotten bit some of that timber into timber which we use to repair the original windows which are which need to have deeper I think I would just repeat uh, again what I said earlier is that um, the building is predicated on natural ventilation uh, we're adjusting both the glazing uh, under the dome in both buildings to have uh, fresh air being drawn in uh, when there are vents we will obviously have boosters that will have allowed the sort of change of air. But importantly, the floor plates at ground level have underfloor heating and cooling. And in the environmentally controlled spaces in the two the sort of lower areas of the building and in the temporary exhibition gallery, we are working with Citygen, uh, who, okay, they are in the process of a decarbonizing process as well, which um, I think it, it fits very well. Um, there was a lot of discussion about City Gen or uh, the museum having their own generation. But, uh, but I think um, it's now been agreed that City Gen is going to be the route forward. And obviously that is recommended by the GLA as well. Now, t um, Tom Butler has uh, thanked you very much for your presentation. He'd like to know what your both of your impressions of Smithfield as a neighbourhood um, are now, and um, how do you both think this will change as the museum is completed and uh, further work on uh, the site is done? Well, we the, the, the Culture Mile, which we haven't really talked about, I apologise, I mean, there's so much we could talk about. Exactly. Um, and it's all been, uh, to some extent, quite rushed. Um, but I go to these uh, Culture Mile uh, meetings and the meat markets are being developed by Studio Everett West. Uh, Hawkins Mound are developing the uh, public realm. Joe Gibbons, we what... Uh, Julian was talking about earlier at the competition stage. We have, we worked with uh, Joe Gibbons, who's a, a, a great friend. We've worked with a lot. Mm -hmm. She brought all these ideas into the proposal, but subsequently the culture mile and uh, mm -hmm. we were not asked to develop that public realm. So in fact, 
we will be working closely and monitoring what's going on with Hawkins Brown. I mean, they're working on a very good, interesting scheme at the moment together. Uh, it will be a fundamental change. One hopes it's not going to be sanitised. I mean, sure, that won't be the case. One wants to keep the grit and the edginess and the sort of, I think, visceralness of the site. I think that's what we all respond to. It's not only within the buildings, mm. you know, and that nighttime culture must carry on. I think it's fundamental uh, to the to the whole site. I'm sure, I'm sure that will be the case. That's what we're all talking about at the moment. Julian, do you have um, any well, They said, um, mm -hmm. we, what we can say is that this is um, a London market which follows in a sequence of London markets which have changed their character and nature. And I think particularly of Covent Garden, of course, and then Spitalfields. And there are many connections between Smithfield and the uh, and that move to the outer parts of London for all those 44-ton trucks which stand there all night uh, running their refrigeration plants. And they, they, they have to have a place perhaps uh, away from the community who live in that area, and perhaps that will be seen as a beneficial change. Mm. But I, I would say, I think the... Um museum, uh, certainly Sharon and her team feel they're going to be one of the key um, orchestrators. They're going to be um, very much central to the whole energy that is going to be um, exuded. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. Another comment. I really hope the reigniting of this site allows a contemplative discoveries um, with regard particularly to the proposed 24-hour nature of the museum. And I suppose that's a comment um, and suppose somewhat related to this is the intrigue of someone else uh, who I can't see their name here, actually. Is anyone recording the history of the actual space during the early 90s rave club scene? Were there any remnants on site? Do you know? Maybe the curators know as well. Um, I have to say, I mean, Julian, we have found some quite extraordinary things on site. <laughs> It is, it is, it, uh, it was when we first went in, it was like entering a time capsule, as I'm saying. I mean, there were remarkable things in the offices at the upper levels of the general market, which we won't, uh, won't refer to. Um, but there was, a, there was quite a lot going on above and beyond the uh, sort of trading of uh, meat. We did, uh, we did, of course, do a protocol of uh, what mater material should be salvaged from uh, the detritus of abandoned offices within the interior. And uh, so we worked with the museum's archaeological department to s evaluate either for their own use or disposal to, uh, to another source, um, all those things which were uh, the objects that memorialise the time of the market. Um, and then there was the physical fabric which we set aside, which we could dispose of uh, for either for money or for reuse. But of course, the market had laid empty, hadn't it, Julian, since uh, uh, 1993. So uh, it had been empty for 30 years. But some of the some of the offices we went into, it was almost as if the people, the traders had left the day before. Yes, you know, I, mean, I mean, remarkable badges, ledgers, um, filing cabinets, dare I say, a couple of beds in there as well. I assume <laughs> that, you know, they would be uh, uh, working very late hours in, in the early morning to go to have a rest. But it, just, um, it was almost as if it had been abandoned overnight in some of the areas, which is um, very moving. I, um, I would go to site at seven o'clock in the morning to meet Mick coming in and um, it was so quiet and isolated that I would wander up to look at the salvaged timber pile with a purpose. Of course I was going to see the timber but I was also going to see whether the fox was there that morning. <laughs> had that, that, that sort of wildness uh, about an abandoned building where nature was coming up 
um, to, well, inspect the new visitors. Great. So one last question, because we need to draw to a close now. But uh, Katie Fisher, um, what if you, and this is echoes my own uh, wish question um, that I wanted to ask you, what have you found both of you to be the very biggest challenge of the project and how will you overcome it? Mm. I, I, thank, you, thank you, Katie Fisher, for that one. I, I think it's communication. I think it's just talking to one another that's the most difficult thing. And COVID-19 has brought an extra filter to the exchange. I mean, Paul said right at the beginning, um, you know, the experience of, of talking to one another by screen and by this, this means is a dimension of separation from reality. And uh, the, the opportunity for everybody to go and feel the bricks, feel the timber, look at the works going on on site. I think I've made something like 62 visits to the site since March. And so that connection which we're able to enjoy is not available to a wider group of people because of the limitations of the present emergency. Yeah. I think the, uh, for, yeah, I, I totally agree with what Julian said. I think that's been the same for any architectural practice or, or anybody uh, working on Zoom. Uh, hugely um, uh, emotional, it sort of, it, it's, diff it, it's difficult. But what I, what I would say, above and beyond all of that, is that um, when you're entering into buildings that are literally um, collapsing from one month to another. Uh, you're trying to align budgets and programs with that. Uh, I don't think we, as I, I think I did say earlier, that uh, we didn't anticipate that. But clearly, we are uh, working to um, budgets. And so there's a sort of, we, we've got to continually be quite nimble in terms of where we might shift budgets and money from one part of a building to another in order to either retain that. So there are continual dialogues and discussions going on. Um, the dialogue with uh, uh, Asif Khan and Julian Harrop and ourselves, I mean, it's both at times totally in sync and sometimes it's totally out of sync. I think that's fair to say. I mean, there's a creative tension there, which is exactly why the team was put together, uh, but we have sorted out, resolved those differences, but fundamentally with the client, who is the ultimate arbiter. Um, but that, I think, Julian, has been, it, it's not an easy ride when you do have a building that is literally leaked or appearing, you know, you put your finger in the dam one minute and the water, you know, in the roof and the water's coming out in another part. You know, water is something that museums cannot have around them. At the moment, we have a site that has a lot of water coming into it, and that's got to be stopped. Uh, and, and that will carry on until the building opens in 2024. <laughs> well, so uh, watch. Thanks very much. So watch this space. I mean, you're, you're, um, you've got a, a momentous task ahead of you, but... Um, boy, I think this presentation has conveyed so, so well um, and uh, in huge de detail, really, exactly how you're going to command the tasks ahead of you. So um, the agility in communication act and activity is obviously, as you mentioned, is absolutely pivotal. So um, thanks very much, Paul and Julian, for sure. such a, 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 a really stimulating and truly inspiring talk about our, our new Museum of London, transformed and transformative in its cultural power and, and truly will be truly embedded within the city in a dynamic and, and a innovative and fascinating way, but also in a way that seems almost truly kind of organic. It has to be an organic um, uh, entity, um, a very powerful force, I feel sure, it's going to be. So thank you very much also for your combined intelligence, the rigor, 
impressive assessment of the challenges and exactly you know how you're going to creatively deal with them and thank you very much to our audience stay safe and we look forward to seeing you again at our future temple bar trust talks i just want to make a quick announcement about what we have coming up next on the 12th of uh, November, we have the architects Kevin Carmody, Andy Grok of Carmody Grok talking about a project of theirs in the City of London. And on the 3rd of December, we have the architect and academic Sumita Sinha, founder of her practice Ecologic and the founder of Architects for Change, uh, Reba's Equality Forum, who recently campaigned to be Reba president. Um, she will respond to our Pathfinders strand in our program. A uh, series that celebrates architects and urban designers breaking boundaries in the exploration of issues of identity, meaning, resilience, and livability in their work. Now, we have the city makers and the pathfinders strand, but moreover, I think it's undoubtedly the case that all architects and uh, urban designers and engineers are. At the moment, they are dealing with issues of identity, meaning, resilience and livability. Um, but um, Sumita's particular take on this topic will be one worth worth putting in your diary and, um, and watching. So thanks again, everybody, and see you all very soon.